Welcome, colleagues. Welcome to our presentation this evening. Uh, some housekeeping rules first. Let's let's get that out of the way, and then we'll we'll start. Attendees are reminded to ensure that the volume is turned off on their device. Also, ensure that you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure good streaming, and your audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel, uh, which is located within the go to webinar control panel. By default, the control panel is on the right hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to use the chat function. However, you are encouraged to ask questions and you do the questions via the questions panel. A recording of the presentation will be made available on the Institute's YouTube channel, SAIE TV. The recording will also be made available on the SAIE website under the events drop down menu in the section past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to your YouTube channel for more uploads. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. Right, and thank you. Thank you for your attendance today, and we'll start with the proceedings. Our agenda for the day reads as follows. I'm your moderator. I will provide a brief introduction and then we will have a formal welcome from the Chair of the Power and Energy Section, Mrs. Ntumbela. There will be an address from two co-hosts. We have with us the Chairman of the IEEE South Africa Section, and we also have the Executive Director of the Southern African Power Pool. Thereafter, we'll follow through with the keynote address from the IEEE President-elect, Professor Rahman. And then we'll have ample time for questions and answers. As your moderator for today, my name is Pat Naidu, and I have a few slides to share with you. Firstly, in terms of the United Nations Agenda 2030, Transforming Our World, we have goal number seven, that is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. This goal seven is very much followed by goal 13, whereby we need to take urgent action in terms of climate change and its impact on the global community. 7.1 of the goal seven calls for universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy. Nothing here, the emphasis on universal access, electricity for all, energy for all. Goal two talks about increasing substantially the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. So we're looking for a diversified portfolio of energy resources. And in the mix, we would find diversity, we will find strength. And then part three of goal seven calls for the doubling, the doubling of the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency. And today's talk is dedicated to this very part of the goal. How can we create much, much more efficiency in all that we do as engineers? Our host for today is the chairperson of the power and energy section. And uh, Mrs. Sintombele, I'll read how to buy your first and then I'll call her to, to say a few words. Mrs. Sintombele is the plant and refurbishment team leader at ESCOM. And she is tasked with ensuring continuous improvement of plant to comply with current technological practices, safety standards, and desired operating performance. And again, the goal is to extend the useful life of all the plant. She is the current chairperson of the Power and Energy Section under the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers and is also a current member of council. She has a BSc degree in electrical and electronic engineering from the University of Johannesburg. Mrs. Ntombele, let me hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof, for a warm welcome. Uh, good evening uh, to you all. I'm Engineer Ntombele, 
I currently serve in the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers as the Power and Energy Section Chair. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all attendees to this exciting webinar, which is brought to you by the Power and Energy Section in collaboration with IEEE, SEP, and SIGRE. I'd like to extend my gratitude to our moderator, Prof. Naidu, Minx and the team work tirelessly to ensure that we are able to bring this webinar to you. I want to assure you colleagues that we recognize and appreciate your contribution. I'd like to also appreciate our presenters for volunteering their time to enlighten us on this important subject of energy efficiency in smart buildings. Just to give a brief of background, uh, on power and energy, energy section, our mandate is to lead, direct, influence policies in electrical and engineering fields and associated sciences, to promote and uphold professional standing of members of the Institute, to promote and advance educational training in the electrical engineering and associated sciences in South Africa. Our membership is comprised of industry professionals and also academics with a common interest in the electric and power industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I assure you will learn a thing or two from this webinar, so sit back, relax and enjoy. Thank you. Over to you, Prof. Naidu. Thank you, ma'am. Colleagues, I'm going to introduce to you our first co-host speaker, the chairman of the IEEE South Africa section, David. David, a recipient of the IEEE MGA Gold Award and the EBE Faculty Special Award for Social Responsiveness at the University of Cape Town, is the current chairman of IEEE South Africa section. He holds a PhD in Electrical Engineering from the University of Cape Town. Over the years, he has served in many IEEE committees and organizational units, including IEEE PUW, IEEE Young Professionals, IEEE Site Steering Committee, EPICS and IEEE Committee of the IEEE EM, IEEE South Africa Section, XCOM, and led a number of EPICS in IEEE and TS TISP projects in South Africa. Wow, lots of acronyms from IEEE. David has a passion for community-based outreach projects. His research interests are in power system stability, geomagnetically induced currents, and renewable energy. Over to David, and I'll hand over the panel to David. Welcome, David, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Um, and to Stabile for that introduction and to our colleagues um, around the world, we appreciate joining us this evening. The title of my presentation this evening, which is a very short one, is around speaking to the subject of our webinar this evening through the view of efficiency in decentralized generation and power distribution. A little bit more about the IEEE. The mission of the IEEE really um, is to foster technological innovation and excellence for the benefit of humanity. And we see some of these um, being met through the COVID-19 project that the IEEE is currently um, busy with. Then that also fits nicely within the vision of the IEEE, which is to be essential to the global community, most importantly, the, the technical community, our technical professionals, and to be universally recognized for the contribution of technology and of technical professions in improving global conditions. And that includes conditions in South Africa with regards to the practice of electrical engineering, as well as how we as an institute um, can advance um, humanity through our use of technology. So speaking briefly into the title of our discussion, the topic of our discussion this evening, I would like to look through the power system as a power system engineer myself. And if we consider the conventional power system, or some would call it the traditional power system, 
we see decentralized large synchronous generation around the country and that's a norm around the world and then the transmission network is quite extensive um, for bulk um, power transmission um, 400 kV and above and then at the distribution level we see an extensive network as well what also characterizes the traditional power system is the vertical monodirectional flow of electrical power. But in recent times, over the last um, couple of decades, we've gotten into the transitional power system mode, which um, is characterized by large scale decentralized, um, smaller non synchronous generation. And that, of course, is made possible through um, the increase in R&D in the PV space, wind, and other forms of um, renewable energy power generation. Embedded in all of these is the increased drive for efficiency. And that is the synergy between uh, my brief talk and the subject of the main presentation this evening. Within this transitional, transitional power system um, scope, we realized that uh, large scale decentralized smaller non synchronous generation is becoming a norm and the question is how do we actually manage this and most importantly um, how do we drive higher efficiency efficiency levels in the generation distribution um, and transmission of electrical power as i mentioned earlier on the increased drive for efficiency um, has come to the fore coupled with the need for advanced control and monitoring. And this is where um, the Internet of Things um, concept really becomes a key um, factor in this whole um, discourse. And from the power perspective, some of the considerations that have been brought to the fore includes the issue around unbalance in the electrical network, especially the three-phase power system. They will talk about um, losses in power distribution and transmission the multi-directional flow of electrical power as a result of the non-vertical approach to generation, transmission, and distribution. And then we would love for participants in the market to have the independent choice of when to sink or source power. And this really speaks to if you are um, an IPP or you have a reasonably sized um, renewable energy uh, power generation source, you should have the independent choice to decide when to source or sink that is already happening um, based on prevailing market conditions um, at the time. So taking all of this into consideration, we realize that the requirements slash challenges um, in increasing the efficiency in power generation, distribution and transmission are similar to the IoT sensor integration. And there are a couple of points that I have outlined on the projector on the, on the screen that you currently view on your device. And the first is that there is an additional need for instrumentation and monitoring to ensure that um, we, we get the right data in order for the system to be able to make a very good decisions um, autonomously. The increased consideration and application of artificial intelligence in this space the dynamic control of source slash sink of electrical power based on real time data. Some of the concerns that are linked to that is the issue around data accuracy and fidelity, um, data security, computational intelligence, um, intensity and location. Do we have these nodes within the um, entire system doing some computational work and then feeding result to other participants in order for those participants to be able to make um, very good decisions within the scope of increasing efficiency and ensuring that um, moving forward we run a more efficient um, power system. So these are the challenges that we are dealing with in the power and energy space which IoT becomes a very very strong player as well as the concept around um, sensor integration. But I believe um, Prof. Rahman in his um, talk will elaborate more on some of these um, issues. The point that I haven't mentioned um, at this um, time is the issue around real slash near time optimization to increase energy efficiency. 
but in you know well mostly with regards to the use of electrical power that becomes very very key in ensuring that we, we run an efficient um, power system and of course with regards to buildings and and other utilities around um, cities and municipalities to ensure that they are smart and intelligent as well as um, efficient in their operations um, just before i end my talk i'd like to just remind us that the ieee um, is just over 40 years old it has quite a number of chapters and committees including the power and energy society um, which gets involved with a, a number of activities in the power and energy space um, the same applies to the many other societies that um, we have registered in the South Africa section. Um, we just about a thousand members strong and we really value our collaboration with the SAIEE over the many years. I think it's been a very beneficial um, working um, relationship between the two institutes and my encouragement to you is um, you can contact me or any of the XCOM members to find out um, how you can get involved and the big question is, what would you like to achieve um, with the IEEE? Um, thank you very much for your um, audience. And I would hand over back to Professor Naidu. Thank, thank you, David. Thank you. And we will take questions towards the end. Let us continue and I'll bring on board uh, the next co-host my colleague from the Southern African Power Pool. And uh, let me also bring on my webcam uh, so you could see me. And uh, I would like to say hello to all my colleagues across SADC. I know if Stephen is presenting, all of Southern Africa will be listening. So Stephen's coming to us live from Harare, Zimbabwe. Welcome, Stephen. I'm just going to read off your profile first and uh, we'll then give you the chance to present. Uh, Stephen. Three-decade career commenced at Zesa, Zimbabwe, as Business Development Director of the Zimbabwe Electricity Transmission Company, followed by System Planning Advisor to EDM of Mozambique under the leadership of Vattenfall Power Consultants. From 2008 to 2012, he worked for Nampower Namibia in System Planning and Security and then in their Renewable Energy and System Integration Division. Thereafter, he had three years as a consultant power engineer for the African Development Bank in Zimbabwe before moving to the Ministry of Energy and Power Development as principal director from 2016 to 2017. He is currently the Southern African Power Pool Coordination Center Executive Director based in Harare. Countable for regional generation and transmission projects, power pool operations and electricity trading. Stephen holds an MSc in Electrical Power Engineering from the University in the UK a BSc in Electrical Engineering from the University in Zimbabwe, and a Diploma in Management from ISM in the UK. And Stephen, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us as co-host on this important assignment on energy efficiency. I hand over to Stephen to deliver his welcome address. Over to Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. And thank you for this opportunity for SAP to participate in this um, webinar. What I'm going to talk about is a bit about the Southern African Power Pool and its connection with uh, energy efficiency. You will notice from my first slide that there are two maps on either side. Um, they are not for decoration, but in principle, they are there to show on the left hand side the expected future hydro power stations that could actually be developed in the region. And on the right hand side, those red lines show potential transmission corridors that could actually be developed to move power from the various sources of generation. I'm going to talk briefly looking at the overview of SAP, transmission connections. I'll look at the demand and supply balance. I'll look at electricity trading in the region. 
and finally close off with um, energy efficiency. That map shows you the 12 countries that SAP operates in, which are the mainland SADC states, which uh, cover countries that have got a, population, a total population of about 300 million people with installed generation capacity of about 72 gigawatts. In terms of the history, SAP was established in 1995 under the Southern African Development Community through the signing of Intergovernmental Memorandum of Understanding. The key objectives being to cooperate and coordinate in planning and operation of the electric power systems in the region, to facilitate electricity trading, to promote regional cooperation in power projects, focusing mainly on generation and transmission, as well as to increase access to electricity in a reliable and sustainable manner. If we then look closely at how the countries are interconnected, we will notice that currently only nine countries are interconnected to the transmission grid uh, covering the whole region. Three of them are not yet connected. Uh, that I've just shown those three as countries that are not yet joined together with the rest of the countries in the region. But I'm happy to report that we expect Malawi to be connected very soon through Mozambique. We also expect Tanzania to be connected very soon. There's a project that's already ongoing uh, where Tanzania is going to be connected to Zambia. And in fact, Tanzania is also being connected to Kenya, which means we're actually looking at the SAP being connected to the EAPP. Angola will be connected to Namibia as well as to DRC and their plans to even connect it to Zambia. With that, we then have an interconnected grid. Just looking at it di diagrammatically, we have interconnections between these countries at various voltages varying from 110 kV to 400 kV AC, and we even have 533 kV HVDC. So that's quite a, tr a strong interconnection between these countries. And it will be important to ensure that the energy resources in these countries can be shared together. Hence, the need to see what happens when we look at the balance of supply and demand in each of these countries. What I'm showing in that, in that table is that the countries that are shown in blue are those that are not yet interconnected. And we're looking at the snapshot of the power supply situation as of the peak load of 2019. And you will notice that for those three countries that are not interconnected, two of them actually had access. One is much excess as almost 2000 megawatts. You then look at those that I've shown in black and red, you will notice that only one country had access. The rest were in deficit, total deficit close to 2000 which could have been covered by that country that is not interconnected. So it's important that all the countries are interconnected, but the next issue is how do we then ensure that these countries share their resources so that those that are in deficit will end up getting something. The only way to do that is through electricity trading. There's been developing development over the years in terms of the um, electricity trading in the SADC region. Starting as far back as 2001, we've migrated to a point where currently we actually have uh, various portfolios that we are managing at the coordination center here in Harare. We have the day ahead market. We then have uh, two physical forward markets. That's the month ahead and the week ahead. We also have an intraday market, which basically is an hour ahead market, which commenced in 2016 to ensure that there is more energy that could be traded. We are cognizant that we need to increase these portfolios to allow more trading to take place. Hence, we are working on a balancing market. We are also working on an ancillary services market. We also see the need for some kind of financial market which will allow longer term commitments that could be developed under the auspices of the market. And as we do that, it then brings in the whole opportunity where members can be able to trade energy 
members can be able to share their excess resources. Those that are in deficit also get an opportunity where they can actually get uh, energy from others. That now brings me to focus on the issue of energy efficiency. And you need to know that SAP recognizes the importance of energy efficiency, both on the supply side and on the demand side. And as such, we actually have a working group that focuses on how we can coordinate the issue of energy efficiency within the region. SAP can actually utilize smart load centers wherever they are in the region in the power system supply optimization process. We therefore are very interested to know what's happening in terms of uh, smart technologies, in terms of the use of internet of things, in uh, managing demand at various spots within the countries that are operating under SAP. We are aware that there are a lot of expected benefits from application of energy efficiency initiatives. And just looking at them in two groups, if you look at it from a national level point of view, we are aware that we will expect to get reduction in power deficit for some countries. And we also expect that those that are in excess, they could actually release more excess energy and hence be able to export that excess energy. In other words, this all plays into increasing the level of electricity that could be traded within the region. We know that the result of that will actually be reduction in cost of electricity production. If that happens, that will lead to reduction in electricity cost to the end customers and thus improvement of livelihoods. And I know as engineers, our main aim is how can we improve the livelihoods of people? And from an electricity perspective, we believe that energy efficiency is a key role in leading towards the reduction of the cost of electricity to the end customer. From a regional perspective, we expect that there will be increased level of electricity trading, like I've already explained. There should therefore be a reduction in electricity markets, market prices. And remember, this is a competitive market. And with all these optimizations being put in place, we expect the prices to come down. This will result in a reduction as well as deferment of generation and transmission projects that could be developed in the region. And this gives benefits to all the countries as we share our resources. I'm not going into to go into details in talking about the, some of the technologies behind energy efficiency, and I'm glad that today we've got a speaker who will delve into that. So mine is a statement of support to say from a regional perspective, as a power pool, we really welcome all the developments that are taking place as far as energy efficiency is concerned. So in conclusion, I would like to say that SAP provides an opportunity of sharing energy resources at regional level for the benefit of all. SAP provides an opportunity of allowing benefits of energy efficiency to filter through a larger geographical spread. And SAP sees greater benefits in the use of smart technologies in the energy efficiency applications. I thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, colleagues. I see Prof. Roman has joined us from Virginia Tech on the East Coast of the United States. I will bring Prof. Roman on board. I will read his CV, his bio, and then introduce you to Prof. Roman. Let me take that off. Get that on. Prof. Raman is the founding director of the Advanced Research Institute at Virginia Tech, USA, where he is the Joseph R. Loring Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He also directs the Center for Energy and the Global Environment. He's a Life Fellow of IEEE and an IEEE Millennium Medal winner. He was the president of the IEEE Power and Energy Society for 2018 and 2019. He is the founding editor-in-chief of the IEEE Electrification Magazine 
and the IEEE Transactions on Sustainable Energy. He has published over 140 journal papers and has made over 400 conference and invited presentations. 2006, he served on the IEEE Board of Directors as the Vice President for Publications. He's a distinguished lecturer for the IEEE Power and Energy Society in over 30 countries. He's the founder of BEM Controls, LCC, a Virginia, USA-based software company providing building energy management solutions. Served as chair of the U.S. National Science Foundation Advisory Committee for International Science and Engineering from 2010 to 2013. He has a PhD in electrical engineering from Virginia Tech. Professor Rahman is IEEE president-elect candidate for the period 2020 to 2021. I hand you over now to Professor Rahman, who will deliver the keynote address for this evening. Prof, over to you. Pat, thank you. Can you hear me, Pat? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Yes. Okay, hold on. Yeah, your screen is coming on. See it now? And you can give us, yes, your screen is on. Full screen? And we'd like, yeah, uh, go full screen and then bring yourself on, get your video cam on. Yeah, this is not, I don't know why that's not working. Give me a second. Okay, a take, second. Your time. take your time. We've okay. got it. Hold on. Hold on a second. Okay, is camera on now? Yes, you are on now. Very good. Welcome, Prof. Very good. We'd like to see your screen now. Okay, hold on a second. This is the problem here. One second. Ah, there we are. Yeah, the full screen now? Uh, yes, sort of. We need to just get it onto slide mode. Hold on a second. Slideshow, that should then give us. At the top of your screen, it says end show, new slideshow. Maybe, maybe that's where you need to go. Uh, hold on. How about now? No slide? Yeah, it's coming. I think it's coming. It's blank for now. I can see your slides. All right. I just did that. It was fine. What's wrong? Uh, yeah, no, we got you as presenter. You are there. We got you as presenter. Yeah. Share your screen. Just say share your screen. I'm sharing a screen, my screen right now. All Micro right, it's... Computer audio. Yeah. Um, screen. My screen. Uh... I can see everybody else. Let me do this, Pat. Let me let me let me take back the presentation. I'll send it back to you just now. Please, please, please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'll bring you back just now. Okay. Okay. We've got it to that point. All right, let's colleagues, let's give Prof. Rahman a few minutes to get his side organized.
let me get organized. Okay. Let's take a few questions so long. We've got some questions that have come through from our two presenters. And uh, to Stephen and uh, David, let me run through some of these questions and then we can provide some responses while we're waiting for Prof to get ready. Uh, we've got a first one here from John Smith Hart. With regards to SAP, although the theory of energy trade could benefit the states of the SAP, the question is what currency and financial regulation shall be used between all these states? In the EU, trade is via the euro and the United States, we have the dollar. How will fair and competitive trade be obtained between the SAP states? Stephen, would you like to take that question? I'll pass the presentation over to you. Yes, Prof, let me take um, that question. We are currently already trading and we are trading using two currencies. That is the US dollar and the rand. And the way we are doing it is that we are actually managing the exchange rate between those. In other words, the risk is being managed by the market operator rather than the players themselves. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Let's take one from Hannes, Hannes van Yerden. Uh, he says he partially heard a discussion right in the beginning on CPD points for the webinar, but didn't catch everything. If we could just repeat what we had said at the beginning. That's me. Hannes, what we had said was a certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar. And we would apply to XR for a validation number. And as soon as we get the number, we will we'll then post you your certificate. So you would get CPD points for this webinar. Thank you. There's one for Dr. David. Let's get David's one. To Dr. David, the national grid stability is somewhat attributed to the fact there is large synchronous power generation feeding into one inlet bus bar. What can we do to ensure that we'll drive for more non-synchronous generation feeding into the grid that stability is maintained? You get that, David? Thank you very much um, for that question. That um, concern has been there for a while and it's ongoing. Um, some of the researchers that we have in the country, including myself, have been concerned and they first principles around um, how we define and understand power system inertia and in my view need some updates um, pr primarily because the traditional definitions um, do not include some of the unique conditions in South Africa i.e the very long transmission lines and the fact that we have large um, synchronous inertia um, we call them the six-pack big boys in Mpumalanga those big um, coal fire power stations yeah, so one of the things that um, can be done in the short to medium term, still at the R&D level, is to consider um, large scale grid energy storage um, that will have the required power electronics to provide um, rapid response to load changes in the network. Um, that's one of the strategies that um, have been considered. Um, a second approach to that also is to consider the advantage of diversity in renewable energy power generation um, based on the plants that, that are around the country. That also provides an opportunity. So in conclusion, um, responding to that um, question, the decentralized nature of renewable energy power generation um, becomes one of the um, solutions towards mitigating that, but also understanding what the maximum penetration level will be taking instantaneous inertia definitions into consideration. Because in, in as much as we could have, say 20, 30, 40% renewable energy um, power penetration in the network, the considerations around instantaneous inertia, coupled with the diversity in renewable energy power generation, um, will have to be considered closely in order to provide long-term lasting solutions. 
Over to you, um, Professor Naido. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Let's take one more from Stephen. For Stephen from Bungani. Thank you. Let's take one from Bungani for Stephen. Other than technical issues, the African continent is ravaged by war and instabilities. With a drive to move into a one connected Africa, what can we do to ensure that we maintain a good energy availability factor? That is, we can guarantee power will be available when needed by another country within the network. So this is very much a sort of an umbrella type question for Stephen. Over to you. Thank you, Prof. That's quite an interesting question. And indeed, we know that um, Africa is uh, challenged Did you get by, that, Stephen? Uh, sorry, Prof. Can I go ahead, Prof? Yes, Sorry. you can go ahead. We can hear right. you. I'll make you the presenter. Carry on. Yes, right. please go I ahead. Was, I was saying that that's quite an interesting question, and indeed, we are aware that the African continent is. We can uh, hear you, facing, Stephen. Is facing all these challenges of um, wars and uh, sometimes civil wars as as well. But, but one of the interesting things that history has shown is that despite the challenges of wars, electricity trading has actually continued to take place even in the midst of uh, these challenges. There are clear examples in the past, for example, before Zimbabwe and Zambia were independent, that uh, despite the fact that there was animosity in the countries, electricity trading took place. And I can go on and say you are aware, for example, that for a long time in Mozambique, there was um, civil war as well. But it had uh, very little impact as far as uh, the movement of electricity, for example, from Mozambique to South Africa. So all I can say is from a historical perspective, it looks like even though there could be a lot of challenges in terms of wars taking place in the various countries, it has tended not to have a huge impact on electricity trading. In terms of project development, yes, there could be issues, but there's been a lot of cooperation between countries in terms of uh, developing interconnectors and moving the grid forward, which is the reason why right now we're talking about the nine countries interconnected and we'll see all the 12 interconnected very soon. So my, my belief is there will be minimum impact of these uh, wars on the actual development of the power system in the region. Back to you, Prof. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, let's try and see if we can get Professor Rahman back again. I'm going to Try and bring him on board. Prof Raman, I'm making you presenter now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Pat? Yes, Prof, yes, you are audible. Yes, okay, we can I'm hear you. I've yes, given I'm you a presentation. Right? Full screen. Right. Full screen now. Okay. You're audible. Can you see my screen? Yes, Prof. You can. Good, good, good. On. Thank you, everybody. Now we're waiting to receive it. Okay, let me know, Pat, when I can start. Yes, you can start. Over to you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for attending this session. It's uh, evening time. It's uh, early afternoon for me. So this is energy efficiency, smart building, and IoT sensor. Three things I'll talk about. I heard the SAP presentation. 
I also work on cross-border power transfer. Maybe I can talk about that during Q&A session. I have some ideas about that issue as well. So focusing on energy efficiency and so on, before I go there, this is the U.S. situation. U.S. has about 6.3 million commercial buildings from a grocery store to a shopping mall. Out of that set, 40% for that building set, 40% of the total energy in the U.S. is consumed by buildings. That is not electricity only, electricity, gas, oil, everything else that is uh, goes go to run a building or the buildings. 90% of the 6.3 million buildings are small, meaning 500 square meter, small size or medium size, under 5,000 square meters. That's the building stock in the U.S. Because they are small, these buildings cannot afford the expensive automated building automation systems. As a result, they don't do much automation. If it's too cold, bring a room heater, too hard, open the windows. That kind of stuff goes on in the U.S. We got a grant from U.S. government sometime back to develop a low-cost, expandable building automation system, which is my IoT-based network, which would be usable by smaller buildings. So we built this platform called WISE Building, W-I-S-E-B-L-D-G. That's available app on the, on the App Store. And I'll talk about that, how we built it, and how you can be a user of something of that type. Okay, so what we have done, we have built what I call an open architecture platform for open art platform for building automation. Is my slides visible now or not visible? Now we can see your desktop. Yeah, I don't know what and happened. Oh, give me a second, give me a second. I'm gonna fix this. Something got changed, one second. Thank you. But I can actually see your slides. My slides are desktop. What do you see? Your desktop. Yeah, I don't want my desktop. I want slides. One show one second. Okay. Yeah, but Prof, we can't see you. You should. I'm going to bring my slides back. Give me a second. One second. Sure. See the slide now? Not yet. Not yet? OK. OK. And see the slide then, now? Uh, OK, we can see it. Full Not screen? yet. Full screen. Do you see slide or desktop? We see the um, slide. The slide open architecture platform for building energy efficiency. That's the slide okay, that we can you, see. Thank right you. Now. Thank you. That's all I want. Okay. So this is we build this platform is open architecture meaning. I know why getting lost. Meaning it is expandable. So suppose you build this platform to do your building automation. What does it mean? The red box in the middle, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, lighting, plug loads, all of that is done. Then you decide to add rooftop solar on your building top. This platform is open architecture. That means it can let you bring the control for rooftop solar as well. It can also let you add, let's say, security camera. It can let you add a storage battery. So this is the flexibility we have. So this is what we are talking about now, how we built it. This is the technology. This is one building, in one floor of a building. This is my lab setup. I have many thermostats. I have a uh, volume controller for air volume controller. I got rooftop units, smart light, a smart switch, 
a lighting load controller, smart plug, smart meter, all of that stuff is available for this. So what I have done in the lab situation here, we can talk to all these devices and manage the building using a small microcomputer. Like they see the plastic box in the middle, it's called a Raspberry Pi, for example. It's very simple. Then we said, well, this is one building, one floor. Suppose the building is large, many floors, many buildings, what do you do? Well, then you go to the cloud. Before I go to the cloud, I should point out, you may also realize this, we are using commercially available hardware. We are not making anything ourselves. We buy stuff from hardware store, Amazon, all of that, thermostat, light switch. As you know, every manufacturer has their own protocol to communicate with devices. So that protocol could look like this, Ethernet, serial interface, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, BACnet, Modbus, all of that possible. Our contribution was we can take any protocol, any data exchange network and get the information out. That was our contribution. As a result, we can be very flexible, add many things over time. Now let's see expanding this idea from one floor or one building to a campus. A campus has many buildings. So we now forgot that small computer, which is Raspberry Pi, said because it can go bad, it can lose power, we get rid of this. We then went to the cloud. So all the algorithm that we are using, the hardware interconnections are in the cloud. That means all these devices, heating, ventilation, thermostat, lighting load, plug load, solar power meter, sensors, water meter, rooftop solar, battery storage, security camera, must be a cloud compatible device. Again, cloud compatible. That means either they can be seen in the cloud using the address for the device, or we can put a access point in the building, like a network access to see this building, see these devices. That's what we did. Fine, so if we, if we go forward now, What's happening? This is our contribution. We say this wise building platform that we built can make any old building smart. Why, why do I say that? Typically, when you talk about building automation, this is done, placed in the building when the building is under construction. Because you need wiring, you need a SCADA system, data connection, connection activities. That means, the older buildings can never take advantage of building automation system. That's a fact. Because of our algorithm, our selection of, selection of uh, smart devices, cloud devices, we don't need any wiring. We just go in, put the device wireless on the wall, and begin to get data. That's why I say we can make any old building smart. Here's an example. Because we have done this automation, we have some data that we, I can share with you. Our data shows if I deploy this wise building platform in any old building on the average, by changing the temperature setting and the schedule, I can save on the average 20% in heating and cooling applications. And lighting activities even more, on the average we save 25%. In addition to the savings, this platform gives you some advanced warning. For example, you saw the picture before, we put a power meter in, in one building. So power meter will give you power, wattage, voltage, current, power factor for the device. As you see, if you are watching the current on a, on a, on a regular interval, for some reason current draw goes up. Why for a motor can the current draw go up? One motor had more resistance, more load, or the bearing may be the bearing may be going bad. Bearing goes bad, more friction, motor draws more current. This is an early warning system that we can tell the building engineer, look, your rooftop number six is drawing more current than it should. Please take a look. Yeah, he goes up and sees that yeah, bearing is 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 going to give or something got friction, and he'll take some action. That means he'll fix it 
before the whole system failed. This early warning system. Similarly, we can also watch the indoor environment, not just temperature, humidity, air quality, that includes CO2, PM 2.5, many other things, dust level. So those can be helpful in making the building more comfortable to work in. Okay, some examples now. We have deployed in many buildings in the Washington DC area. So the address doesn't mean anything to you, that's fine. So here's an example. This is an old building built in 1947, so 73 years ago now. It's an academic building, classroom in this building. So building is fine. What we did, we went to one floor of that building and looked at this classroom. In this classroom, we put a sensor to send CO2 level, noise, temperature, humidity, and the like. That's one thing. Below that is a box called BMOS, B-E-M-O-S-S. -S. That is that small Raspberry Pi microcomputer I mentioned before that is collecting all the information. And it has also our algorithm to control the sensors based on what you want done. Below that box is a box called plug load controller. That is used to turn things on and off. This classroom has a computer, a printer, a Xerox machine and an LCD projector. Class happens in the evening, five to eight or six to nine, class is done. Nobody turns those things off. They stay on all night, all weekend, always. We have put this smart plug in that room. Now they're connecting all these devices, your printer, computer to that plug, not to the uh, wall socket. Then I can program it that after 10 p.m. every day, turn this thing off. Even though it is computer is on, we know nobody's going to use it. It can be overridden, by the way. That's one example. On the left hand side, another box called motion sensor. If there is no motion in the room, we'll turn the lights down or off and change the cooling temperature set. Thermostat is driving the rooftop air conditioner. And thermostat will be given a signal by the motion sensor that room or nobody in the room raise the temperature for uh, cooling season and uh, drop it for heating season that's how we set it now look at this picture here this is a screen capture for the control laptop which is managing this building you see temperature humidity pressure co2 level noise outdoor temperature on the like also, yeah, I'm showing you here a graph on the blue box on the lower right hand side showing the concentration of CO2 in that classroom as people enter the classroom, begin to take classes, and they sit there. Of course, the big, before the class starts at 5 p.m., I had about 500 parts per million close to ambient. As the class goes on, 6 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock, the CO2 level begins to increase and goes as high as 1,100 by about 9 o'clock or 9.30 peak. Then people leave the classroom, CO2 level goes down by 11 o'clock or so or midnight, it's just ambient. That's what we expect. What does it mean? We discovered this by accident. We were planning for temperature control, not CO2 control. When that happens, if CO2 level goes over 700 parts per million in an enclosed environment, you begin to feel uncomfortable, feel dizzy, feel lack of energy because too much CO2 in your system. So this is something we didn't know. And I have seen myself <clears throat> work in a building, not my building, some other building, come home at night, feel kind of lack of energy, lack of uh, lack of uh, interest i tell my family i had a bad day at work it's not a bad day at work you just breathe too much co2 so how we solve this problem as the co2 level goes over 700 parts per million in this classroom we throw more fresh air if throw more fresh air the co2 gets diluted and the temp and the level of co2 comes down this is this is not heating and cooling this is health issues as i said before by applying our building automation system we can make the building more comfortable good now the other part you all realize your power engineers the power that we buy or energy that we buy has two components energy and capacity 
in this building, because of the peak pricing that we have in application in this part of the city or this, this part of the power network, uh, we want to see what we can do to reduce peak load and energy consumption. Before I did anything, I went in there, the data from 2014, July, June, July, August. I said, what is the floor, this is one floor by the way, not the whole building, one floor doing uh, without any intervention? Well, we saw three months, the floor was using 8,340 kilowatt hour. And what we deployed in the building, we put six thermostats on different floors, six power meters, a battery, and a sensor for the environmental data. Fine, 8,340 kilowatt hour, no problem. Then we said, we went in there after some time, we picked similar days in the following two years and found these days in June, July, August comparable to the base case. And as you deploy our solution, we got 26.8% savings. That's our data. Now, two issues, energy and peak power. You see the middle of the picture, this gray box on the top, temperature profile before wise building demand reduction. Three lines, blue, which is the power consumption by the air conditioner. Green is the temperature setting. And red is the thermostat set point. We put 74 degree Fahrenheit or about 22.5 centigrade. That's the setting I have, no problem. As the AC is off in the beginning, like 12 o'clock or so in this picture, uh, temperature begins to rise. It rises to about 75 or 23.5 degrees centigrade, AC comes on. Obviously, AC comes on. When the AC comes on, the temperature goes down, and then temperature goes below the set point, AC turns off. You see the blue spikes and the flat horizontal line in between, it goes on like this all day, no problem. We were told this part of the network has a peak pricing in effect from one to 5 p.m. Price is high, much higher. We said, can we play with the air conditioner so that we don't run the compressor, just the fan, it's possible. Again, on the other side of the picture, we do not want to make the students uncomfortable. We say, okay, we will keep the temperature below or at or below 24, let's say, uh, 24, okay. So what we did to make life easier, we pre-cooled the room from 12 noon to 1 p.m. And 1 p.m. is the time when the higher price goes into effect. Pre-cool it, no problem, and turn the compressor off turn the compressor off, you will save quite a bit with, as you know, for air conditioner, the main load is the compressor and the fan is the smaller load. So we, we kept the fan, the compressor off, temperature creeps up by five o'clock, it was at 75, which is 24 or so, uh, 77, I mean, 24 degrees or so, and that's it, done. Look at the data summary, the gray box and the, and the yellow box. Gray box is before our inter intervention, wise building not used. So energy use was 2.72 kilowatt hour for that room for four hours, 3.98 kilowatt peak load. With intervention, I ex raised the, all I did, raised the set point to 77 degree F for about 20, 25 degree Fahrenheit, uh, centigrade, 25. Energy usage dropped from 2.7 to 1.4. Peak load dropped from 3.98 2.5. Huge savings. This is a big support for the building operator. They are now paying much less for peaking demand price. Good, let's move on. Now, if you see, we have a second building which is doing lighting control. The office building, three, I'm showing you pictures of three areas are being shown here. In the middle is the work area, which, which has a skylight and filing cabinet standard. On the upper right is your work area for the staff, and lower right is the conference room. If I go in there, see sunny day outside, good lighting from skylight, all the lights are on. I said, why don't you turn the lights off? If you turn the lights off, some parts of the room on the wall side get pretty dark and people don't like it. So only solution is waste energy or dim the light, don't turn them off, 
to save energy. We chose to dim it. How much I dimmed, I'll talk about later on. But this one case, on the upper right-hand side for the work area, we watch when they go to lunch, when they come to work, when they leave. And based on that, we devised a dimming schedule for that space. But the conference room, typically what happens when staff comes to work in the morning, they turn everything off. There may not be a conference going on till 11 o'clock, but it's on and left on all day. That's standard practice here. I said, we know the schedule when the conference will take place for meetings. These are reserved on by reserve, reservation basis. So when we know nobody is going to use the room, why keep the lights on full capacity? Dim it. Don't turn it off. Then people will get scared. Dim it so you can see people, but not enough to read a book. Just fine. We did the analysis based on what is used, when, by, and how long. We created a dimming schedule, but see the bottom, of the, I'll give you the schedule in a second. Bottom of the screen shows how much we saved for that floor from lighting load only for a nine month period, October 16th through June 17th. And very good, one third of us saved. This is my dimming schedule at the bottom, but before I go there, let's, let's look at the table. Total energy cal using calculation for the LED capacity, if they are, they are not dim, they're running at certain capacity, that number is, see the column here, 399 for October, 423 for November, December 426, like this. Know that, then we apply our dimming schedule, the 399 number goes to 264 and so on and so forth. As a result, on the right-hand side of the screen, the right-hand column, you see savings 34% average. Now, look at the bottom of the note. Our dimming schedule is 6.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. Office area that we showed you before, the area with the skylight, 50% because it's not, it's not uh, required due to the skylight. Office area, 45%, chief's office area, 60%, all those numbers. You may ask that question, how do I know those numbers? What we did is manually done. We went into the building and my students and watched them for a week. What did they do? Based on that information, we said this makes sense. We put in there, working fine. We told them if the boss thinks he needs more light in his office, all he does, he tells the staff, change the setting from 60 to 70%. It doesn't need an engineer. It just says you slide a bar on your laptop, do this. As a result, you get this kind of savings, which we find very attractive. That's a lighting load. Now let's look at rooftop solar. As I said before, it is open architecture. I want to show you, even though we built a building automation system, because it is open architecture, it can accept other devices that you add later on to the building, which can be added to building automation. If you went for a commercial building automation system like Siemens, Honeywell, and all that, you cannot do this. You only do heating, cooling, and air conditioning. So this is a day, sunny outside, solar is fine. Another sunny day is this also, sunny day, but we got snow on the solar panel. We don't go to the roof in winter and clear the snow. We just let it melt or the rain takes care of it. My point is this building automation system I talked about, this is the screen capture. In addition to temperature, humidity, um, uh, then talk about uh, power usage, we also give you this data like radiation, DC wattage output, AC watt output, panel efficiency, DC voltage, DC current, DC power, array radiation, wind speed, all of that information is there. So what I'm saying here, if on a summer hot day, you are watching that the rooftop temperature is high, you would know that the building would require more air conditioning because a more heat gain going to be the, the case. Because of heat gain, I can do some pre-cooling or, or ventilation so that I am not stuck drawing a lot of power during peak hours and pay a lot of high price electricity. That's the idea. So my solar, not only for solar, 
it gives me the data outside the building for the existing environment suppose it is going to be quite windy it's windy the room the building is cooled by the wind flow so all of this information is used to make the building more efficient and use less energy to run the building okay battery storage similar thing we store the battery we use the storage battery here to reduce the peak load during the high price time so that we pay less energy very simple thing five kilowatt 12 kilowatt hour battery and this is how it looks like on your or on your dashboard for the uh, wise building system battery charging discharging battery state all of that is given to you so my summary is we believe all buildings should be smart buildings because that's how you can build make the building comfortable use less energy than you have to and peak load is reduced so if you want to know more go to this website bemcontrols.com that website has case studies it also has on the right hand side on the top green box or take a tour if you go there click that you'll see a video of my lab where you did this control just if you're interested fine so this is the technical description i'm going to just take a couple of minutes to talk about ieee and what i would like to see ieee become as we go forward so we all are suffering from covid 19 but we know we'll get out of this sometime in not too distant future so that means like we're doing today i'm in the us you're in south africa we are talking and giving presentations. We did not do that before. So COVID has forced us to find other ways to collaborate, cooperate, and build some solutions that applies to other people as well, number one. For that to happen, we need IEEE to be broader, meaning bring more people into our, uh, our umbrella so they can find reason to work together. For that to be functioning, the IEEE governance must be open and inviting. So I would like to see we in IEEE management become more inviting so that technologists and other people from academia, industry, government find IEEE an inviting and friendly environment. Finally, this is a very important case I have seen in the last few years. I go to many countries of the world. I talk about people's uh, IEEE membership status and they give me business card. Some say senior member, SMIEEE. I have seen compared to US and Canada, the number of senior members per country's membership number is much less in regions eight, which is Africa, Middle East, Europe, region eight. Region nine is Latin America and region 10 is Asia Pacific, much less. It is not difficult to become a IEEE senior member. People don't do that because they don't know the thing is very difficult. So I want to make sure when I become president, create a committee of awareness building, like South Africa chapter, South Africa section, they give a template how to become an IEEE senior member. It also requires three references, so as a section chair or a chapter chair, you'll have a roster of existing senior members who will be willing and able to write references for other chapters or section colleagues who are not senior members yet. Easy to do, but it hasn't been done yet. Next is fellows. Fellows is much more difficult, but the requirement for a fellow from industry has been reduced a little bit now. It's easier, but people don't know that. So I have created in PES a fellow nomination committee whose job is to look at fellow nomination draft paperwork, review and make recommendations. As a result, our success rate has gone up because we are creating better prepared nomination packages. The challenge for fellow is that nominators may not be very experienced, they nominate, but the packaging is not very, very tight. So they lose out. I want to help on that regard as well. This is it. Finally, this is my, my um, last slide. Pat has mentioned this already. I will not talk about it. I'm running for president. The other reason I show this slide, is I know there'll be Q&A after I'm, I'm done. I am sure I will not be able to answer all your questions. So if you don't get a chance to get my answer today, 
make a note of this website, I mean, email address, s.rahman at iwa.org, and email me your questions, please. Happy to answer. Again, I have been doing many things. I've formed the PS Chapters Council in Africa, where South Africa is a member. They're helping to promote IEEE activities in the African continent by providing linkage to industry, bring industry in, helping industry engineers come to classes, give lectures or give talks, you know, guest lectures, I mean, so on and so forth. Also, I'm giving you here my a website, is my name, srahman.org, that has slides my, of other lectures I've given in this, in this uh, situation. This lecture I'm giving now will be also posted there. And I'm also for younger generation, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, I'm on uh, Twitter and YouTube. So I'm going to stop here, Pat, and take questions or comments, if any. So you can go back and uh, take take charge of the uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. First class, thank you. OK, good. OK, good. Colleagues, we're at that point where we're going to start with questions, and I'll get my colleagues to help me. Uh, Mrs. Ndombela, the Chapter Chair, Power and Energy Section, Southern Africa Institute. Would you like to lead? It's fine, Prof. Let me quickly look at the questions. Uh, not sure if we have uh, answered this one. It says, it's from 47. It says, what will be the most useful smart technology to address server supply intermi intermittency? In countries like Zambia, it's for okay. Stephen. Okay, take an example of how to deal intermittency. Very good question. Uh, we know that I showed you my rooftop solar. It changes as cloud moves in. I've shown you the solar when it is uh, snow outside. So what I have done, you need some storage. I showed you my battery storage here, some storage, but I don't want to buy such a big storage that I can control the whole building without solar at all. That's very expensive and takes a lot of space. What I have done in my calculation, when I see intermittency, I will play with my load first. So playing with the load, I see how much I can reduce my load as the supply goes down. You saw the numbers where we are reducing the peak load by changing the temperature setting by changing light intensity setting. I can change the uh, lighting power demand. So I would, depending on your building, which I do not know, look at the first thing you do, use a power meter to measure your building power consumption on a minute by minute basis, get a profile. And then if you can put a uh, pyrometer on the roof to see how the solar output changes. That's my purpose of putting solar was exactly that. And to see how the building load shape and the solar output shape match or doesn't match. Then you can do some analytics. See when you think you have the maximum mismatch under what conditions. And then you can see if I, if I was in your building, try to control your lighting load, your air conditioning load, I'll see based on the past performance, how much savings I can get by reducing light intensity. I saw my numbers, 33, 34%. Uh, for wind, for air conditioning, I could drop by 50% from peak load because of the compressor being turned off. So all those analysis have to be done. And then you can have an answer to this question, but I'm giving you the methodology, how you'll go by doing this. Could be a, a master's thesis, for example. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Prof. Prof. Next question one, is, sorry, carry how, on. How do you deal with security issues arising in the smart building network and guarantee no trespassing or phishing activities with consumers' data? Sure, a very good point. What I have done, you saw my building data. I use, I don't put my own network. It's a cyber security issue. So that's why I went to the cloud. When I have a thermostat with cloud compatible, the company which has 
sold me the thermostat has their cloud presence and they have a cloud protocol which is password protected so they will get the network information encrypt it and send it what we do we collect the temperature setting let's say as you saw already we collect the current uh, usage auto off get that information we encrypt it and send to the cloud in the cloud our data gets exchanged with the company which sold the device their cloud account exchange okay. information since we are exchanging information between my secure system and their secure system using encryption the chance of hacking and phishing doesn't come up much and then when they we decide to send a command like we i just said our supply is limited i want to raise the temperature so that ac turns off that command comes in to the thermostat and executed you might think you might say well when the command is coming in executed somebody does phishing and sends the wrong information it's possible how we protect it we have some hard coded numbers meaning if somebody is fishing and sending it signal that for oh, this building in summertime let's say uh, he wants to go temperature to 35 degrees c it's possible they can do that we have some numbers built in that we would not let the temperature setting go over 25 degrees c so if somebody fishes and sends a signal they'll be ignored because at the gate we'll see that number is more than 25 would not get through that's how we manage the lighting intensity control and the and the temperature control so i hope that makes sense next question thank you thank you prof the next question is from andrew do you know of any smart building technology project being implemented in south africa no <laughs> <laughs> i i don't but you know what i could suggest uh we have in ieee smart cities program and i have given lecture in fact in casablanca last year on smart building in smart cities so i do i'm just thinking out loud where can i send you uh i don't know maybe s your saiwe may have an answer i do not know maybe pat knows <laughs> Yeah, no, no, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I think it's very much a, a new field in South Africa, and, and it's something that is being explored. I know my colleagues are starting to work on this chapter, but uh, as yet, we, I don't think we have too many testimonies. Okay. Let's take one question from uh, Kenneth Subramani. Kenneth says, thank you for an interesting presentation, and uh, he wants to know about the security around the cloud solution in particular. Can you comment on that? Yeah, that's a very good point because when you go to cloud, we use very highly secure cloud providers like Amazon Web Services. And only risk is the data transfers from my server in my building to the cloud, to the network. That's the risk. If a Google got caught two years ago, they were not encrypting the information. Now, what we do as the information is collected and we make a decision to do something could be dimming control temperature control that information is not sent via the open network is is encrypted and sent over the internet so you'll see something going through but you cannot tell what it is that encryption is very very important and we have to encrypt and decrypt at the receiving end again we, we have to give them uh, keys to decrypt that information. So that's how we make sure. And the problem is encryption and decryption take time. As they take time, if you have a requirement for millisecond or, or, or sub-second uh, command execution, you got a problem. In our case, our execution time is not even seconds. It would be 30 seconds, could be a minute. So we are safe. But it, if it has to be a case where you need to work in a millisecond environment, there is a problem because if too much encryption in the data security takes time and that's where things get bogged down thank you prof 
There's one from John, who's the chair of IEEE Nigeria section. Okay. Uh, John has, has given you an IEEE president-elect question. What plans do you have for the West African countries? Okay, John, thank this you. I'm giving a talk in Nigeria next month. Thank you, John. <laughs> there you go. West African countries, I have been to Nigeria. I know how it feels there. Uh, again, two things. One is I want to make the section and the chapter more powerful in the sense you will have year of the president to do this. Many times things get unresolved because possible solutions are not transferred to the right place. That is why I built what is called PS Africa Chapters Council. All the chapter chairs report to a council head and the head of the Africa Council is a gentleman in, in Ghana. He's from uh, Ghana uh, grid. He has direct access to the PS president, direct access. You can send him email to do this. So for West Africa, I would like to see, Nigeria is a member, of course, I mean, Chief Tunde is a good friend of mine. Nigeria has access to PS governing board, but I hope with the IEEE section that you lead, John, will in my system that I have created, will have a channel for you to raise your issues, and we can have a committee of IEEE outreach, which I have in PES, outreach committee, who will be taking this information, discuss it, and provide solutions for implementation in Nigeria and in, in fact, all African countries. Thank you, thank you, Prof. There's one from Tabello, and Tabello talks about the protocols. Given that most of the existing building automation systems are largely driven by OEMs, Correct. There's, the, there's the issue around protocols. Can right. IEEE play a role in helping to bring standardization into protocols so as to enable the quicker adoption of IoT technology? Very good point. As you, I just showed in my slide, there are many protocols in operation today. I typically developed this 802.11, you know that this is a wireless Wi-Fi protocol. I typically also developed ACP, Smart Energy Protocol 2030. So we're hoping these are open protocols, anybody can use them. We're hoping by this one, we would not be using some, many companies in the BS system have their own protocols, right? own closed systems. So as we open up the net, this is my whole idea. I want to, make the protocol public domain so that you as a building owner are not stuck with one company's products. You can use many companies like I did. So this is the difference. So what can IEEE do? I work with IEEE Standards Association very closely and I can talk to them and mention that push ACP 2030, push, uh, push uh, 802.11, 802 NZ, all of that and make it open available to people like in Africa or people in, in other countries. And again, Pat, I got, the, I got the idea, I hope so by now. I want things to be done organically, ground up. But for that to happen, I must empower the chapters, the sections, so they have something to do. And they have knowledge about their country, their culture, their environment, that is a rich set of data that doesn't get transferred to IEEE headquarters, never does go there. But I want to make sure there's a channel for that idea to percolate. And as a result, we'll have open standards, which will be used by vendors because open standard means your product is more interchangeable and will sell more quantities. But that thinking has not come in yet. I hope I can push that through uh, by the IEEE Standards Association people. No, I'm in full agreement to that. Excellent. Prof, there's one from Ignis. Ignis wants to comment, uh, wants a comment on the G5, G3, G4 technologies. What dependency do we have in terms of communications technologies? G5 is, will be ideally suited for smart cities, smart buildings. Will it run efficiently, equally efficient on G3 and G4 technologies? The reason the system I have now 
runs quite well on on G3, G4. In fact, I'm building, I have building that I deployed, I didn't show it to today in my presentation. As, a, as you can tell, for a cloud solution, I must have building internet to get the data and get it to the cloud and bring it back and do some, execute some commands. I need the internet. Some buildings for their own security would not let me use their building network for security purposes. What I did for that case in Virginia, in this, in this case, I built a network using basically telephone SIM card. I put a, a data access point in that building and using SIM card get data out. This 4G, by the way. And they work perfectly fine. The reason it works for us because our frequency is not that high resolution. I can command, I can get data every 30 seconds, every minute is good enough. I don't need every second for that matter because their thermal system lighting also can be dimmed slowly. That's the advantage I have. Number two, I have tested my network using 5G. In fact, the local phone company here came to us and wanted to test it. We can do that, but the overhead is so high, so so high and so expensive. I do, if you need to transmit data in gigabits per second, then 5G is okay. Below that, you don't need to invest that much money. The answer is yes, you can use it, but I think it's for the application I have, it's an overkill. Thank you, Prof. We have another comment from Otto Obong in the IEEE Nigeria section. Uh, Otto wants to know of uh, additional plans for young professionals and PES student branch chapters in particular. I think you did cover it, but uh, maybe you could just re-comment re on that. Yeah, sure, sure. Now, YP for PES is a very big focus for us. I work with the YP people. We have, PES has about 39,000 members. We have almost 8,000 YP or 7,000 something YP, big number in PES. We push it very hard. We have a YP committee. We have a YP person who sits on the governing board of PES. So that's when doing very well. The other thing is we want to give YPs thing to do. Like India, I'm encouraging YPs to do events. Like you mentioned student branch. I've given, I give one talk this morning or last night in Malaysia, organized by the local student branch, YPs. So this is happening. Again, the fundamental issue is the leadership must not only talk about it, they must let them function. And the leadership should highlight what was achieved by a certain student branch as an example, as a, as a, as a showcase, so they feel they have been listened to. This is my operation. I want to work at the ground level highlight success stories and let people share this success story to benefit each other. I hope that makes sense to you. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, we'll take one more question from Vasu Chetty. And uh, Vasu wants to comment on the Southern African power pool and uh, it's probably with respect to the new emerging markets and uh, the experiences that you have back in the States with power pools, uh, sort of PJM and, uh, and the others, and how they are adapting to this new changing market environment. Well, two things. One is intra-country power pool, one is inter-country power pool. Let's talk about intra-country power pool first. Like you mentioned PJM. What is happening because of the Corona pandemic, factories are not running as well. Like my, I've not been to office for three months now. My office building is much less electricity. So all this frequency response, auxiliary services, which are required to meet peak load at a very high price, things are changing. So what are they doing in the US? They are relaxing their boundary conditions. For example, if you have wind or solar, you can bid in the uh, day ahead forecast so that you get a certain price. 
and if you don't meet your day ahead forecast you get some penalty not not for if you don't, if you don't meet the supply to match your forecast you have a penalty because of this uncertain things they are more relaxed in terms of uh, forecast not being met so this is something we are doing to make sure we don't discourage renewables and demand response offer offerings from coming into play that's one talk inter-country transfer i heard the q a before i came on board this uh, after this evening today and i work with quite a bit with iea in international agent and energy agency and others on global power exchange i looked at us canada us mexico then looked at uh, gulf countries gcc countries looked at china to myanmar looked at malaysia singapore all of this happening so what is and somebody has the right question a buying country feels nervous being too dependent on a selling country suppose you have political disagreement they turn the power off somebody just said a mozambique example this evening that even though politically it was unfriendly but power never stopped similarly Qatar was kind of kicked out of GCC some time back, but they run a six country power pool, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, Oman, and UAE. They never had any question about operation. Operation went perfectly fine, no problem. But this is, this could be an exception. What is the guarantee? What International Energy Agency is talking about now, they'll have some protocol. If a country signs a buying and selling agreement between them, the third party would be kind of a guarantor that the selling party cannot unilaterally turn the tap off and start the buying country. They must have some other reason to do that. This discussion is going on now. So inter-country is more serious unless you're friendly. US, Canada, no problem. US, Mexico, no problem. European countries, they buy and sell all the time. But if you go to Africa, same thing might happen. I saw the presentation about the SAP to, to uh, maps on the screen so i think to establish working relationship you need history and you need to understand what's going on so i'm hopeful but it is not going to be easy it'll take some time thank you prof i think we've come to the end of the of the session for today let's leave it at that and we would like to express our appreciation to yourself, Prof, and to our co-hosts, IEEE South Africa section and the Southern African Power Pool for this evening's webinar. Uh, we, will, we will announce the future webinars with Prof Rahman. We've got one scheduled for August, possibly a fourth one for August. And then into September would be the IEEE board elections. And possibly we'll have Prof Rahman back as the president of IEEE. So with that good news, <laughs> let us let us take leave of you today, and uh, and we will reconvene at our next webinar in August. So I have promised. Let me say thank you to our colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everyone, and uh, let me just come on board. Right. Thank you everyone, and thank you very much for your support this evening, and we look forward to you joining us on our next webinar. Thank you and good evening from Johannesburg. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Goodbye.